My name is Mei Pang, and this is my story. She was a very good assistant. What kinds of things would you do on a daily basis? Taking care of everything. Working in the studio, doing clothes, doing the publicity. Yoko walked into my office and said, John and I are not getting along. I want you to go out with him. Well, are you kidding? I can't do that. He's my employee. He's my boss. He's your husband. I was 23. And my first boyfriend was John Lennon. Last weekend that everybody keeps talking about, uh, it wasn't so long. People saw more of John than they had in the previous years. Jammed with Mick Jagger, with Ringo, Harry Nielsen, Elton John, David Bowie. That's a few things. Right? <laughs> she did not realize it was going to turn into such a big love affair. She thought it would be two weeks, gone, goodbye. She told me, this is something you're taking John back. And I said, what? She said, I think it's time. Start off, so... May, thank you very much for, for joining us. Have you uh, dried out from uh, Friday's torrential rain? Oh, please. It, it's like unbelievable. And it's like, I was just glad to be home. That's all I cared about at the end of the day. Saw that rain. It was, I know, we, I, eight inches in Central Park. It's a record. Oof. But the uh, state of emergency is now over and you're with us. All dry. We out. got sunshine. <laughs> That's what we got. Cool. Fantastic. My, my niece is working in the United Nations at the moment, so she's uh, she's been upstate today and telling me about a fantastic time she's having over there. Good. Oh, that's wonderful. Because I'm like I, I was worried for Saturday since it was my daughter's wedding. That's why I was saying, "Oh my God, I hope it doesn't carry over." <laughs> so yeah, she's working at the General Assembly at the moment, but she hasn't seen any UFOs yet. Ah, okay. <laughs> And I, I can't I can't produce it because that one came down and it flew past the UN when John <laughs> and I saw it. So, yes. <laughs> well, let me just introduce you to my good friend, uh, John Heeson, who's joining us from Budapest. And John is a Beatles influencer and has a very highly regarded YouTube channel. Oh, cool. I yeah. love that. Good. Right. And all I can say is just thank you very much for joining, but also for, for giving us um, the, the, the Lost Weekend, the love story. I watched it over the weekend. I yes. found it incredibly emotional. Uh, I won't give away anything, but I must admit at the end, there were a few tears shed on my side as well. So you, you made well, me cry. Okay, that's good. I'm glad a man can admit that he that he shed a few tears on this one. I'm always happy to do that. But I think the most important thing, obviously a hugely creative, commercially successful period for, for John, and I think you must have been one of the few people there with him who can actually recollect <laughs> what was going on. Because I understand you weren't drinking, you weren't smoking. Your only addiction was was Coke. Coca-Cola, <laughs> yes. Let's Not make really. sure we distinct that, you know, <laughs> distinction on that too. It was Coca-Cola, yes. Yeah. Um, that was one of those things. And they had bottles back then. So I'm, I'm dousing it constantly. It was like morning to night. It was like, that was all I wanted. Once in, once in a while, I will have an occasional wine. It was very rare. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's take uh, back almost to the beginning when you joined um, APCO. You, you landed a job uh, with, with no experience. You blagged, it, blagged your way through it. Excellent. I, I like that. I like the, uh, the schutzpah. Um, what were your dealings with Alan Klein during that period? What are your recollections of Klein? I didn't see the man for almost three months. Because he was out of the office doing whatever he was doing. So I only dealt with the people in the office. And it was it was fine. It was hectic. They had just moved into the the building. They were constantly changing. I didn't understand how things were working. You know, uh, there were a lot of things happening. And I was just trying to suss it out all around and uh, trying to keep quiet and and do the, you know, and do my work. But try to understand what was happening it was confusing you weren't, you weren't trying to avoid him no he wasn't even in the office and I think the first time he had come into the office he was talking to the vice president of general counsel Harold Sider 
who later became John's personal lawyer. Um, he was in there and I, I didn't know it was Klein, but he comes in and I hear his voice. I say, oh, that looks like him because he's in back of me. Mm -hmm. And he goes, Harold. And he goes, and Harold goes, get the effing out of my office. And I'm thinking, oh, that's interesting. A vice president throwing out the president of the company. How does that work? I don't understand this one. And so he kept throwing him out of the office till finally, I mean, he, he rejected him. He kept saying, I want you to talk to the guy for five minutes because I don't have time. Get out. And it, this went on for a good five, 10 minutes behind me. And I'm like, oh my God, what is going on here? So that's so my then, first introduction to Alan Klein. Fair enough. So, so then you uh, you met uh, John and Yoko, and you were invited over to Tittenhurst Park uh, yes. fairly early on. Right. What are your recollections is... of Tittenhurst Park? And uh, you were there for the, the filming of the Imagine video. Right. They had been filming all throughout the year, and this was like um, a time they were doing something else. Because if you notice... If anybody watched the original Imagines, all like vignettes that they've put together and from all different places. So <clears throat> I was there and I just remembered going, it's like a, a fantasy park. And I couldn't believe it was like 80 acres. I actually got lost on it at one point. Couldn't figure out, I had to look for the house because I got lost on the property. And uh, it was amazing, um, big house. Uh, I believe it's Georgian and they had all these rooms and apparently when they got the house, they knocked it all down all the walls to make big wall, you know, big rooms because there were all these tiny rooms. And then when they knocked it all down, it was like these huge, huge rooms, which of course you saw like where he sits uh, with the piano doing imagine. And uh, later on that carpeting that was just laid down uh, when we had our flat in New York, John ordered to bring that to New York. He goes, we haven't used it. Send it over. So they wrapped it up and sent that over. But the whole yeah. house was just, uh, it was amazing. And they had a lot of uh, row houses for people who worked for them at the top of the, at the at the front gate, near the front gate. It was really nice. And of course, uh, Ringo eventually ended up with uh, the property. Did you, did, did you visit it then? Yes, I did. He put, um, I think I have a picture of, he put up a huge dinosaur, like a Tyrannosaurus Rex sitting in the back and something else. I, I remember going, my God, he has these things sitting on the property. Um, there's a lake on the property. And I remember John uh, said to me, turned to me, he goes, what do you think, May? I said, what do you mean? He goes, what do you think of the lake? I said, that's lovely. A huge lake here. He goes, yeah, it's, it's really nice, except for the rubber bottom. And I went, what? He had it put in because he wanted water. So he had, he had a lake put in. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and then you, you come back to, to, to New York. You become Johnny Yoko's personal assistant. And right. I think your right. first recording session is, uh, is October 71 at uh, Record Plant East and Happy Christmas War is over. Correct. It was a, it was exciting for me, you know, because now I'm, I'm actually in a studio working on music. You know, that's what my whole love is about. And <clears throat> when I was working uh, even at the office, I mean, I couldn't have gotten a better training ground, as I would say, because you had Alan Klein had the Cameo Parkway um, uh, records and publishing. And and he also had now the, the Beatles he was administering. The Beatles um, were really uh, Paul, jo not Paul, sorry, George, Ringo, and John stuff, and then all the Apple stuff. And then he also had the Sam Cooke catalog, and he also had the Rolling Stones catalog. Good training. I was actually amazed how much um, um, music there is in your movie. Um, so um, a lot of uh, documentaries, there, there are problems with clearances, but you, your, your team's done a fantastic job with not just uh, John's songs, but also I, I love the fact you use salt water as well from Julian. Yeah, it, uh, it just fits. And, you know, everything just worked really well. And uh, I thought that I was, it, was, it was really the team did a good job. 
So what was it like working with Phil Spector as producer on that uh, first session? Presumably very different from two years later in, in, in L.A. Um, you know, I always thought he was a little out there and he was a lot more controlled at that point. Um, I didn't it was it was OK. He was just manic, but not as crazy as I saw him two years later. It was just, you know, it, it, in New York, he didn't, ha I guess it's because he didn't have his team sitting there. You know, he didn't have L.A., which is his training ground. How, how much was Phil producing that session versus John and Yoko? Happy Christmas, War is out. I think it, it was. between them, the dynamic. I think, I think at that point I could see about half, half, but John really knows. When when John wanted something, he knew what he wanted. He would he would just go out there and just do it, and then he would tell them, "I really want this," and then they would, you know, unless it was something that you can convince him to change it, it was always it would be John's way. Right. So, do you think uh, John was uh, presumably he was aware that he kind of nicked the tune to "Happy Christmas" from that song "Stewball"? Um, did that not bother him? At all. I guess it didn't. You know, it's uh, he just he just you know he he did it. I and think in his head, if you're gonna do it, you know, he's just writing. He does free flow writing himself, so I don't think he thinks about. Well, I'm going to do a direct cut from this or a direct cut from that. You know, he gets a tune, he'll take it a little bit of it, and then it snowballs into something else. And of course, I understand what you're saying. You know, it sounds a little bit like this, but then it takes off into something else. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I, love the story about, I love the story about Hugh McCracken on that session when he told John that he'd worked with Paul on Ram and John said that was your audition. <laughs> true, true. I loved, I loved Huey. I mean, he was so great. And Huey had a, a look very, sometimes a, a little, a little uh, version where he looked like Paul at one point, you know, so it was kind of funny. Yeah, the, all the musicians on um, on the on the uh, Mind Games album were all, we were all first time, were all the mu New York session musicians, except for Jim Keltner, you know, cause that's who uh, uh, John knew to put it together. But the session guys, it was so fast and quick, he loved it. I think one thing about this uh, period is it's, it, it seems like John's at ease with the world. He's enjoying himself as much as he ever could. And, and you're largely responsible, I guess, for, the, for that. Um, it, I, I like the fact you use the mind games commercial in, in the film as well, where Tony King dresses up in drag as, as a queen. Yes. I haven't seen that for a long time. What was that? What was the inspiration for that commercial? How did that happen? Oh, well, one night it was Tony King had come over. And we were staying at Lou Adler's house and we were talking about, you know, because Tony happened to be, you know, in in um, in L.A. at the same time on holiday. So we put him to use and said, we'll make it a working holiday for you. So it extended his stay. So he was there and they were we were having a discussion about how we're going to make. Uh, you know the promo for it, and it did, and it did happen. And he says, "Oh, wouldn't it be funny?" And they were just having some drinks. He goes, oh, "Yeah, wouldn't it be funny if the Queen happened to be selling this album?" And so Tony went into it, saying, "Yes," and he and you heard him talk, and you know, do the impersonation of the Queen, and th they fell about laughing. They said, "That's it. That's what we got to do," and we suggested it to Capitol, got it done. And they, what happened was they used the actual recording from that night, the cassette recording from that night for, for that, for the commercial. There's a great outtake of Elton John taking some Polaroids with John saying, I'm going to impound all those photos until I get my green card. So, <laughs> I guess that was always on his mind, the uh, potential. Always. Yeah. Uh, you know, the green card for, for, for John was always going to be there because he wanted to live freely and travel. We wanted to go to Hawaii, but we realized we couldn't even go to Hawaii because you're traveling over international waters and then couldn't take the chance of being stopped and being deported. So we, every, if we couldn't leave, we stayed all within this 48 states and that's it. Did John ever drive that Barracuda he bought you? 
Uh, I let him drive. Yes, I, I, with bad eyesight. And <laughs> yes, nobody realizes how bad his eyesight uh, was. I mean, I have to tell you, both Elton, myself, and and John, we all, the three of us, we were just blind leading the blind the whole time. If we all took off our glasses, we couldn't see beyond this far. You know, six inches from our nose. I mean, it was that bad, all of us. So when people think that he could see, he can't see dangling even if it's two feet away he couldn't see it so um yeah it, you know the the uh the green card and the barracuda oh yeah the barracuda well that's that's the funny bit i let him drive on i think it was either the 101 or the 405 in la and that's pretty dangerous as it is and i kept sitting there going tell me when you're ready i'll, I'll take the car back it's okay <laughs> just tell me when you're ready and quit driving i'll do it you know wow uh May I get the impression that uh, Mind Games John was not that proud of for some reason. Uh, personally speaking, I think nothing wrong with the songs. I, mean, I think the production was a little bit left a bit to be desired. And I don't much like something different, the, the female backing vocalist. But apart from that, I think it's a fine album. What, what do you think? I don't think he thought I, it was his what he was nervous about. I don't think it was that he wasn't proud of it. I yeah. think that he was nervous about it because he had gotten remember the year before. Uh, he hadn't been in the studio. He refused to be in the studio because he got trashed for some time in New York City and he had never experienced that. Yeah. So he was shying away from it, not because he was not proud of mind games. Now he was nervous about coming out with something uh, that he hadn't done for a while. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's a famous incident where uh, Phil Spector pulls a gun uh, in the studio, I think in November 73, um, that obviously clearly freaked out John. He explained in some detail about uh, the aftermath in, in the movie. Which I think I it was saying. actually not November, but December. December. Yeah. But uh, it didn't uh, freak out John sufficiently to uh, prevent him from, from going back in the studio. Well, the here was the whole thing. We're all doing a playback. We're listening. It's, and we're in the new studio. We're not in A&M. We're in the record plant West. And, we're and this was the first time in the new studio. And all of a sudden I hear a noise. Everybody in the studio had just ducked. And I'm the only one standing there, typical New York girl, going, what just happened? So I'm standing. And what's even funnier is uh, the person next to me ducked, and it was Phil's mother. Mother Bertha was actually standing next to me. And she ducked. And I'm like, I'm like this, looking around. And I run towards the sound. Everybody's supposed to run away. I'm running towards, open the door, and there's... Phil with the gun is in hand, Mal Evans, who's this big giant teddy bear, mm -hmm. and, and John's going like this with his finger in his ear. He goes, Phil, Phil, stop, you know, you know, uh, stop it or, you know, don't mess with me ears. I can't remember all the words at this morning here. And he goes, um, if you're going to shoot, shoot me, but don't don't mess with me ears. I need them. So well, and, I, and I'm standing there going, what just happened? And and, you know, Mal goes over, he grabbed the gun because I saw him grab the gun. He goes, you shouldn't have this. He goes, you can't tell me what to do. You know, that from Phil. <laughs> and it, what had happened was he he was they were uh, horsing around and he somehow hit um, kept hitting a Mal in the nose and it hurt him. So all Mal did was say, can you not do that? It really hurts me. And he backed up and reached for his to the holster and pulled the gun and it went off. Now, I, I turned around and I said, is everybody okay? And everybody said, yeah, they all went back to work. Well, the next day, John and I are having dinner and Mal was looking for us. He found us at this restaurant. He, I said, I said, John, Mal's coming in. He goes, why? I, so he comes over, he goes, glad I found you. He goes, well, here's the bullet from last night. And we said, bullet? What bullet? Because we really thought that Phil carried blanks. We couldn't think in a million years that somebody would let him wander around with real bullets. Wow, uh, that was a near miss. Yeah, <laughs> and it could have hurt somebody and it just went right into the air and uh, the angels were on our side, let's put it that way. Just the Not thought cool. just it scares me. So, so going forward to 74 in March and uh, Paul and Linda visit the beach house and the last ever known photograph of uh, John Paul together, which I believe you took. 
how 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 was it all? Was it free flowing? Was the did you sense any animosity between the two? There was them, nothing. There was nothing. What had happened was John didn't know this. I only found this out later. Where uh, Paul was uh, had gotten a call from Yoko and uh, said, you know, if you're going out to L.A., can you give uh, give John a message? And the message was, if he wants to come back, um, you know, this is what he's got to do. And because Paul didn't know me from a hole in the wall, he's now saying another person in John's life, right? And um, and so I found out later about it because John came up to me. He he apparently told Paul. He said, he said no. He goes, Yoko and I have moved on. Now he doesn't know that Paul was sent by Yoko. That was all hush hush. And he said, uh, no, he's, he goes, May and I are fine. He goes, we'll always be friends. He goes, I'll always love Yoko as a person, but we've moved on. And that's, that was the, 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 the whole gist of it. And he goes, they just, and he said, they don't understand, you know, that, that Yoko and I are still friends. So that didn't happen, you know, it didn't happen the way that um, it was, that it was supposed to. How much did John keep up with uh, what uh, Paul, George, and Ringo were doing at the time in terms of all, all the albums and singles that they released? Did he did he buy them on the first day of issue? And well, he got them. Let's. I don't think he needed to buy, but if he did, uh, if we went into the store, he would buy. It. But he always was up on them. He always was concerned, no matter what um, anybody thought. He always wanted to know what they were doing. Can, can you actually? Genuine... Can you actually remember sitting down with John and listening to Band on the Run and reading the lyrics and stuff like that, or was it just on in the background? Uh, he would listen to everything, and then you'll, you know, then if he had to do something, he would sit in the background. But he would always listen to see what it was all about. He always was curious. Um, he didn't listen. He didn't want to be the only one out. You know, he says, "Oh, wait a minute." It was there's still slight brotherly, comp you know, competition amongst them. Yeah. He must have been very proud of Ringo's success as well. Absolutely. When we when uh, we went out to L.A., um, we found out, you know, uh, of course, months before uh, Ringo was doing his uh, album, Good Night Vienna. Of course, at that point, we didn't know it was Good Night Vienna. And he said, OK, I'm going to write the song for him. And he wrote Good Night Vienna because it was a saying that his business manager used to say to us. He goes, oh, darling, it's all down to Good Night Vienna. So John loved the phrase and he wrote it out. And that's how he did the song. And just before Walls and Bridges, he had the band do a rough, um, you know, uh, cut for it so that he was going to when he'd be ready for the band, when he got when we would go out to L.A. to help do the song, record the song. And of course, when we got out there and it was all done, uh, they were short one song. And so the song Only You came out because John was going to do it himself. And it turned out that was just in the right key. And he arranged it right on the spot for Ringo to do. So the guide vocals were John's. Yeah. But final question uh, from our side, because we're, we're being, we're being uh, rushing out to, to get the last question. In, um, and it's gone by so quickly. Um, John was uh, planning, I believe, to go to New Orleans. How advanced were those plans? Were tickets bought? What, no, what, what steps we were about to buy tickets, just so you know. So Yoko kept calling. Don't, you know, Yoko was an everyday uh, occurrence here. She would call any time between, you know, one call to 20 calls a day at least. Um, and somehow that day, she wanted him to come over just at that moment, last minute, a Friday. I'll always remember. And I didn't want him to go, but she kept insisting. So it was a, a struggle. And as he was leaving, he says, I'll be back. We'll go to dinner wherever you want to go. We, we just put a, um, a binder. We were talking about buying a house out in Montauk. And then he turned to me and he said, let's get those tickets to go down to New Orleans to see Paul and Linda. Because they had come by the week before to visit us and tell us that they were going down there. And I knew that if I'd gone down, I'd gotten him down to New Orleans, they would have been into a writing session because John actually asked me, he goes, what did, what did I think of them writing again together? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I knew that if I could get him down, he would have been on the album, there would have been a whole thing. But as it were, it didn't happen. I told Paul this many, many years later and he said, sure, sure, sure. 
And then he found a postcard from from Derek Taylor to, um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, from John to Derek saying, thinking of visiting the Max down in New Orleans. So he then realized my story was real, which he didn't think, I mean, you know, years later saying it with no proof is nothing. Yeah. And you were in touch with John right up until 1980. Um, are we going to see a sequel, The Last Five Years, maybe? Ah, a I different love no story. Idea. That's a, that I don't know. That is, um, let's get this one off the ground first, because I know everybody's <laughs> been asking about this period uh, where he was doing so much music, because a lot of the stuff, a few of the songs that were, of course, Double Fantasy, he had rewritten the lyrics, but he had already had the music, like Beautiful Boy. That was done because I was watching some Chinese opera, and he loved the sound of it, so he created the music already. Well, anyone who's interested in John Lennon's solo career, this is an indispensable movie. And I put it right up there with uh, Get Back, Peter Jackson's. Uh, did, what did you think of that, by the way, May? Oh, it was quite interesting. Although some of the continuity drove me crazy because mm. the one day John's wearing one thing and then you see the next scene, he's wearing something else. And then it goes back to the same. And I'm like, mm. I, I need some continuity here. What happened? But I found it interesting, I think, to get the full thing from Let It Be to Get Back Somewhere in the middle is where everything is really more what happened. Yeah. You know? I mean, that was a year before you would have met John initially. It was a much change in that year. Yeah, it was. Yeah, you're right, because it was just so totally different. And you could see how how he was back then. And yet that's not the, always the John that I knew. I mean, my John was just totally different. It was it was the guy, you know, you can come up anytime you want to to have a word with him and talk to him. He was. He was just really all around. I would take him on a bus ride in New York City. You know, he yeah. was easy going. Thanks so the last weekend. Guys. Hey, I just just want to say I'm a huge Badfinger fan as well. I know you were friends with Pete and Tom, and Wish You Were Here is my favorite album. I was wondering which is yours. Probably the No Matter What was uh, my my. No that's no when doubt. I roughly met them, and I was I took Pete and Tommy out to dinner two days, a couple of days before Pete died. I was one of the last. I yeah. happened to be in England, so. I was in Soho, wasn't it? In a Greek restaurant, you were saying. No, it wasn't Soho. It was Hampstead Heath. Oh, it was Hampstead Heath. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right, guys, we're going to have to end May, the... Thank you very much for your time. Best of thank luck. You, uh, with, um, thank you so much. Last weekend. Thank you. I believe it's, uh, it's available on the 13th of October. Where can we go and watch it? How do we stream uh, Andrew? it? Andrew? Do you know what, right now it's virtual? That's All good streamers are available, yeah. You'll be yeah. able to rent and buy it on demand through sites like Amazon, Apple, Comcast, Xfinity, places like that. But everyone on their TV should be able to download it or an iPad or computer or whatever. My credit card is at the ready. May, great luck and thanks for uh, Thank spending you. time with us today. Thank you.